Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today, I have a very special guest. I am honored to have him on the show here for everybody. Uh, Please welcome... San Francisco Bay architect Richard Gage, AIA member of the American Institute of Architects and founder and former CEO of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. He, along with his courageous wife and assistant Gail, continue to lead the charge toward a real investigation into the destruction of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers on 9-11 at richardgage911.org. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lance. Awesome to be here with you. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure's all on our end. Um, <clears throat> I would love it if uh, we're going to, you know, usually I ask guests uh, on this show about why they're entrepreneurs. And you and I were kind of shooting the, you know, shooting the breeze about that before we started recording. But you are such a unique guest and also have a wonderful lecture to give us today. I wonder if instead I could have you first speak about why and how you got started leading the charge on a real investigation into the destruction um, of the towers on 9-11. In other words, what kicked you into high gear? And then, and then please, if you could give your presentation, that would be great. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I'm an architect uh, 30 years now, but uh, in 2006, I was on my way back from a construction observation meeting at Akalani's high school in Lafayette, California, where I worked for a firm, Akol and Yoshi Architects. We had 15 architects in the firm, and I was hearing on the radio on the way back from this construction meeting uh, that uh, David Ray Griffin, uh, who's now written 14 books on the subject of what really happened at the World Trade Center on 9-11. And uh, he was being interviewed by Bonnie Faulkner on KPFA's Guns and Butter program. Pacifica Radio, and, and it was I was just shocked to hear for the first time in my life any alternative theory as to how these towers might have come down. You know, we were told they came down due to the plane impacts and the ensuing fires and the steel weakened and the towers came down. I didn't know there was a third tower that came down. <laughs> I learned that that day also, May 29th, I believe it was. And then... Uh, I, I'm going, wait a minute, a third tower, a 47 story skyscraper. If, if that would have come down, I would have heard about it, but not one of us in the American Institute of Architects, 90,000 members had any inkling of it because it, we didn't hear about it from the American Institute of Architects. Not one bulletin did we get. Mm-hmm. And this is the third worst structural failure in modern history. It should have been the most studied building failure ever because it's completely unprecedented as we'll see the official cause of that building's collapse fire so i had to find out if if that was true and if everything else he was saying was true about uh, beams being hurled out of the twin towers with the ends of them uh, dripping with molten iron trailing thick white smoke clouds ex- witnesses of explosions which he was talking about, which we'll look at today in some detail. So uh, I, I, I had to, I did some research. I go, oh my God, I was trying to disprove, mm-hmm. you know, this conspiracy theorist. And what I found out uh, through months of research is, is that, oh dear, this, this is really a problem. So I put together a PowerPoint, I brought it to my firm. I bought him pizza, made him come in and watch, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Bribed him. Hey, they thought before they saw this presentation, most of them thought I was just nuts, right? Uh, They were just tolerating me. After they saw the evidence that we're going to see today, all of them raised their hand in the end, agreed, oh my God, you're right. These are controlled demolitions. We have to have a real investigation. So you see, this is not just conspiracy theory because now we have 3,600 architects and engineers signed on to the petition demanding a new investigation into the destruction of all three of these World Trade Center high rises. So uh, we're, we're still going after 18 years uh, full time now. 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. And that said, um, so if, if people are, this show is terrestrial, meaning it's uh, it goes on like places like Spotify and iTunes. But for folks that are listening, I highly recommend uh, they head over to the YouTube channel. Um, if, if they're listening terrestrially, maybe pause it, head over to the YouTube channel, because now Richard is going to get into a wonderful presentation and kind of break everything down for us. As if, and, and the, I believe this information, Richard. One of the one of the things I'm hopeful of is that it is very easily digestible for people who have maybe don't even have this on their radar, or or sort of world like you too about, huh? I am I'm so curious about this that I actually my you know trying to prove this so-called conspiracy wrong, and then in the end you find all of the evidence in that kind of way. So without further ado, I, I would love to have you get into the presentation. Cool. Uh, run up that screen if you can, and uh, on your on your end because I'm sharing with you. Yep. Yep. It's here. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, I don't want your audience to be the last to know, Lance. Uh, many millions and millions of Americans uh, are aware now of the evidence, of the explosive evidence of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers, and uh, we have quite a force uh, behind us. We are uh, rocking and rolling, and we always start with Building 7 because it turns out it's the smoking gun of 9-11. And as I mentioned, uh, most architects and engineers don't even know about it. We've gone to the American Institute of Architects conventions, probably seven, eight, nine of them at this point, and we have an evidence booth, you know, those 10 foot by 10 foot booths at the expos. We have the, the, the screen showing them. Uh, the collapses of World Trade Center 7. And uh, we, we asked them, did you know uh, when this happened? What does this look like? Well, this is a 47-story skyscraper, easily the tallest buildings in most of our states. Uh, and it's dwarfed uh, next to the tallest buildings in the world at the time they were built, the Twin Towers, in 1973. They were capped out. But uh, this building is, is, a, is a mammoth building. Each floor is an acre in size. Uh, the, the building seven. Uh, it was the third tower to collapse about 110 yards north of the North Tower, part of the World Trade Center complex, and not hit by a plane. It was hit by some of the debris uh, that uh, came on uh, down from the World Trade Center uh, one, the North Tower. Uh, but it and then there were some fires that were started at about noon. And at uh, seven hours uh, after uh, the Twin Towers collapsed at 520. Uh, this is what happens to this building. The East Penthouse comes down first in an isolated event, and six seconds later, the entire building drops as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. So we're going to take another couple of looks at uh, some analysis of this building's failure. But um, just, just looking at these different views, you can see that the building drops uh, symmetrically, smoothly into its own footprint. And you could probably begin to ask, we can begin to ask ourselves, have I seen this before? <laughs> yeah, we've seen it before, and we'll talk about that. But here's what the official narrative uh, has suggested out of the mouth of Sham Sunder, the project leader at the NIST report. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which was tasked by Congress to explain these collapses to the American people, how and why they collapsed. What does he say about Building 7? What we found was that uncontrolled building fires caused an extraordinary event. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fire. fires. Okay, so we have a collapse due to fires. Let's look at those fires. These are the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of in the building. Uh, they are few, they're small, they're scattered throughout the building. And yet we're told that these fires brought that building down in the manner that you saw. Now we've had a lot of fires in high rises, Lance. Uh, in fact, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of much hotter, larger and longer lasting fires in these buildings, as you can see, we've never lost a steel frame fire protected building ever. 
uh, and, and certainly uh, no high rises. These high rises are fully engulfed in fire after 9-11. Did they come down? No. We have not ever it's lost, again, a steel frame fire protected building in history. Uh, this is the first time it is unprecedented. Well, what does it look like? Let's look at on the right, a series of controlled demolitions on the left, building seven. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives, especially since it looks exactly like a controlled demolition, especially since fire, the official cause of this building's collapse, has never in history brought down a steel frame fire protected building. Well, let's see if it has some of the features of a typical controlled demolition. Uh, what are they? Well, there's a sudden onset of destruction, usually at the base of the building. And uh, let's see if there's a sudden onset. And let's listen to Dan Rather. Shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A, a amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. What? Deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down? Well, this is uh, Dan using his intuition, right? We all should. I mean, we, we have a frame of reference for these types of collapses. Unfortunately, he never repeated that again after 9-11. Uh, and unfortunately, most unfortunately, we have not seen on TV uh, this building's collapse. It, it's like it's been swept under the rug, as I mentioned the AIA has not issued one bulletin on the most significant collapse ever, given that this building wasn't hit by a plane. Uh, and fire had no precedent of, of bringing these buildings down. Feature number two, is there a straight down symmetrical collapse? Let's look from West Street in New York. Yeah, pretty straight down, pretty symmetrical. How does that happen? Well, we have to remove all the core columns, 24 of them at once, instantly, followed about a second later by the perimeter columns, because the bringing down the core brings the perimeter columns on top of it later with that one second delay. Any deviation in this pattern and the building will fall over. That's intuitive. It, it won't it'll it, it won't fall straight down through the path of greatest resistance the 30,000 tons of structural steel in the building does fire have that level of precision no we know what does and we'll get to it even in greater detail but how fast is the building coming down physics teacher david chandler models the building and analyzes it's collapse. It falls at free fall acceleration for most of its fall. Free fall acceleration is, again, as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. Why does it fall at accelerating rate? Because it has no resistance underneath it. If it had any resistance, it would slow down. So in this case, there's no resistance, not one of those 80 columns on any of the 47 floors gave any resistance for most of this building's collapse. Now, NIST was denying free fall for seven years, but when their final report came out seven years later, after 9-11 in 2008, they finally admit that it came down at free fall, but they don't acknowledge the implications of that free fall collapse, that there was no resistance, that the columns had to have been removed, therefore, instantly. So where did the columns go? All of a sudden, all of them on each floor. We're going to find out. Because the evidence shows, as feature number five, that they have been dismembered. 
this 47 story moment resisting steel frame building would have, if it were to collapse, fallen over in, in a mangled uh, set of 20 story high piles. What we see instead is like a house of cards. Every column has been dismembered from every beam and from the columns above and below. When a building collapses due to natural causes, in other words, like an earthquake in this case, in these cases, we have a, a building that's recognizable at least, doesn't collapse like a house of cards. The columns and beams aren't severed one from another and the concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder. Well, what could have caused the damage that we did see in building seven? Let's see what the witnesses say. Here's Daryl, a medical student, uh, being interviewed on 1010 Winds Radio in New York that evening. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire. The, uh, the bottom floors of the building were on fire. And, uh, you know, we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was, uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all... Uh, busted out, and you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out, and uh, the building followed after that. And um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. Um, you know, we were in shock. And then, uh, then the, the worst part. Okay, a sound of a clap of thunder, a shock wave ripping through the building, and the windows busting out, and then the building coming down. How about? Kevin McPadden, former uh, uh, Air Force medic uh, on hand that day. You heard explosions, like boom. It has like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was ex an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. And Bill Rosati, uh, uh, a a, uh, somebody who was standing by. Uh, I was standing like two blocks away, and all of a sudden I just seen a big flash, and then I seen the building coming down, and I just seen people just running everywhere, chaotic-like. A big flash, <laughs> and then the building coming down. And Richard, I just one thing I just want to make sure that the that the viewers and the listeners are aware of is Richard is still only talking about World Trade Center seven separate from the Twin Towers. Yes. So and I you know, that's I think the biggest emphasis at the beginning of this presentation is so once again, he's talking about World Trade Center seven, not even the Twin Towers at this point. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And, and I'm going to shift that. A suggestion on your part, Lance, at this point, this evidence now does indeed apply to both the Twin Towers and Building 7, because we're looking at evidence, we're looking for evidence of incendiaries, uh, specifically ignited thermite. Thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. So we go to official sources like FEMA, who did the first analysis uh, before NIST got a hold of the investigation and threw out this metallurgical examination from their reports. But it was done in May of 2002, the Building Performance Assessment Team report. What did FEMA find in Appendix C? Never before observed eutectic reactions, intergranular melting, capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese. This is pretty incredible. Uh, we're talking about a piece of uh, Swiss cheese like this in this piece of World Trade Center 7 steel. Fires don't do this to steel. Fire office fires don't melt steel. Office fires, particularly these in World Trade Center 7, are only probably five or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. It takes more than 3,000 degrees to melt steel like this. So what is really happening? We've got four, five, six times the temperatures that can be accounted for in the official narrative. Rapid oxidation, sulfidation, liquid iron, that's molten 
iron, by the way. This is not steel either. This is elemental iron that they're documenting here. We haven't used iron in our skyscrapers for 100 years, elemental iron, cast iron. We use alloys that have iron in them, but this is elemental iron, not steel. So how is iron melting? That, again, takes 3,000 degrees. Sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. This is very specific and unanswerable in the official narrative at all. Where's the source of the sulfur? They don't have an answer to this. NIST later comes back and suggests, well, maybe the sulfur came from the gypsum wallboard. <laughs> gypsum wallboard has been used for almost 100 years to protect the steel. It has never in 100 years turned around and attacked the steel that it is designed to protect. It's a ludicrous suggestion by NIST. Steel members in the debris pile appear to have been partly evaporated in extraordinarily high temperatures, says the fire protection engineer, Dr. Jonathan Barnett, who was the author of this FEMA report. There's a problem here. The evaporation of steel takes 4,000 degree temperatures. Where are these temperatures coming from? Not from office fires. They might be able to get achieve 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But no, um, not 4,000. In fact, this is documented also by the structural engineer, Abelhausen Astani Ozel from UC Berkeley. I saw melting of girders in this trade center. Melting of girders. Well, did you think, <laughs> doctor, about how this might have occurred? No, he says anything that happened down in the pile, as he suggests it happened, uh, is not my business. Uh, well, did it happen down in the pile? No. Uh, the temperatures down in the pile are cooler than the temperatures in open air burning fires, not hotter, as has been also suggested by NIST. But we have temperatures documented exceeding 2,500 degrees just in the debris being pulled out of the pile by the crab claw excavators with liquid molten metal pouring out of it. We know the physics of, of how hot some uh, a molten material is by what its color is. If it's bright yellow, it's exceeding 2,500 degrees. Here we have white hot, even hotter than that. Again, office fires can't get a quarter of these temperatures. So we have to begin to look for evidence of incendiaries, ignited incendiaries, which we've already been seeing in the molten metal. Let's see if there's evidence in the World Trade Center dust. All we have to do is go to the US Geological Survey and their particle atlas produced in 2005. They document the findings of billions of previously molten indicating temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees. Iron, not steel, but iron, the byproduct of thermite, by the way, is molten iron at 4,000 degrees. And spherical. So we'll get to the spherical part, but I mean, we're talking about up to 6% of some of these samples, Lance, 6% amounting to about four tons of these previously molten iron microspheres. The EPA says, well, we don't know what these are, but they're a signature component of the World Trade Center dust. This is pretty incredible. Um, where do they come from? Well, here's an experiment, a thermite experiment a small amount of thermite producing thousands of molten iron droplets, about the diameter of a human hair on average. That's what thermite produces. That's where these spheres can come from. Why are they spheres? Aerosolized liquids form themselves into spheres by surface tension. That's just what they do under uh, pressure, pressurized conditions. 
Could that be what is toasting the tops of the cars in and around the World Trade Center uh, in this very high heat event? The clouds that the first responders were running from were describing them as very hot. And so we have to ask ourselves then if that was evidence of ignited thermite, could there be any evidence in the dust also of unignited thermite? What would that be? That would be iron oxide and aluminum powder, the ingredients of thermite. Well, a small team of scientists led by Niels Herod in Copenhagen uh, analyzed seven independently collected samples like this one from Jeanette McKinley's apartment in the South Tower across from uh, the, in, in, a, in an apartment across Liberty Street from the South Tower, which, as we'll see, experienced explosions as well, blowing in their windows. So what does she do? She's an artist. She collects this dust. And unfortunately, it cost her her life. She died of brain cancer a few years later. But one of these, because the, the dust was obviously so toxic from so many different sources, one of which um, uh, could have been this, uh, this, uh, the, these small red gray chips, which the scientists said, gosh, you know, we don't, this looks like paint. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's attracted by a magnet. So it has a high iron content. They go, wow, what's iron, one of the key ingredients of thermite, doing in this paint. They get real curious. They do x-ray energy dispersive spectroscopy on this red layer. What do they find? Iron oxide, the key ingredient of thermite. And aluminum, the other key ingredient of thermite. What are the key ingredients of thermite doing in the paint in all the World Trade Center dust samples that we're collecting here? They get real curious then, and they use an electron microscope and zoom in 50,000 times. What do they find? Rhomboidal-shaped iron oxide crystals and aluminum platelets at the nanoscale, a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair, anywhere from 10 to 100 nanometers. This is an exceptional finding because these are also set in a matrix of oxygen, silica, carbon. What is that? That's organic material. Organic material is used in TNT to expand rapidly and knock things over. Whereas incendiaries destroy by means of heat, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apparently, this material has been developed in a laboratory to become more explosive. So it's an incendiary that's engineered to become more explosive. And we have, uh, this is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. This, this is made only in the most sophisticated, advanced contra defense contracting laboratories. So we've got to get to the bottom of who provided this. One of the things that they found was when the, they put it in a heater, a differential scanning calorimeter, which measures the resultant energy, where they find that this stuff ignites at about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. When it, and, and this is exactly what this material, which was developed in Los, Los Alamos and L Lawrence Livermore Laboratory before 2001, uh, they, in their peer-reviewed literature, document that this is exactly what happens in superthermite and nanothermite, which was developed. So like that, these four samples do exactly that. When they ignite, what do you suppose that they produce? Molten iron microspheres with the same chemical signature as the molten iron microspheres found by R.J. Lee Group, environmental consulting firm, by the U.S. Geological Survey in their World Trade Center dust analysis. So we know exactly where those iron microspheres came from 
that the EPA couldn't identify, USGS wouldn't identify uh, the source of. It's, it's not a mystery anymore. So collectively, this analysis by this team concludes that the red layer is active, unreacted thermitic material incorporating nanotechnology. It's a highly energetic pyrotechnic or explosive material. This is all documented in the 25-page peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. So it's, it's, we've had it uh, since 2009 uh, and, and have been giving it to every elected representative many times and, uh, and putting it out for the media many times. But the story is censored. These people and these institutions do not want to deal with the results of this analysis. Their analysis stands uncontested. No one in the peer reviewed sense, nobody has put forward a paper with their own analysis of these chips identifying that they are uh, something else. It, 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 is, it, it stands firm. So the collective analysis, actually 60 exhibits of which uh, so that we've been looking at so far and that we'll look at with specific regard to the Twin Towers has been submitted to the U.S. Attorney in Southern District of Manhattan for a special grand jury investigation. And we're making the film, bringing those 60 exhibits alive, myself and Mick Harrison, the litigation director of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. Uh, we are together making this film series with two dozen episodes that will uh, that has been filmed already, and we're in uh, the editing process now, so people can help us um, very very much so by visiting our website, richardgage911.org, uh, where we also go into the evidence of the twin towers, which we're about to start. So maybe you might have some questions or comments, Lance, before we dive into the Twin Towers. Well, the one big comment I just want to reemphasize for the audience again, this is so much data <clears throat> to take in and it, it's great. It's great data. It, it's evidential from a visual standpoint, from an empirical standpoint too. There's equations involved with all of it. But there, there was, to be clear to everybody, there was no plane that hit World Trade Center 7 in all of the previous uh, evidence that, that Richard is, is, was, has presented so far up to this point. Um, so that's just, a, I just got to, it's so much data to take in. And I think it's easy to forget about, uh, there's always a meme that comes up on 9-11, you know, in social media ranks where it's like, remember these, but forget about this. And so, and I, that's why, you know, I appreciate Richard putting the World Trade Center out of the, at the forefront because it is, in my opinion as well, the smoking gun and raises all the questions, you know, here on out and thereafter. Um, I've been actually taking notes, Richard as we go, and I've got some additional questions, but I would love for you to keep going. Oh, you bet. Because if Building 7 was a controlled demolition, then it had to have been prepared as such in the months prior to 9-11. And yet, uh, and we saw the evidence for the explosive demolition and implosion, actually. Uh, and if we have to ask ourselves, since they lied about it and told us it came down by office fires, which were burned out more than an hour prior to the building's collapse, which are unprecedented and have never brought down such a building in history, uh, we have a lot of reasons to be skeptical about the official narrative. We need to ask ourselves, could it be possible that there's a set of similar evidence with regard to the Twin Towers? And all we have to do is look at the collapses of each of these towers here simultaneously compared uh, in the north and the south, uh, they are identical. They are absolutely identical uh, with uh, upward, outward arching streamers, a geometry of fireworks, uh, freely flying solid objects trailed by thick white smoke clouds. So yes, we need to be looking at this very specifically. In fact, let's see if it has any of the features of controlled demolition. Beginning with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Uh, 
in this case, at the location of the plane impacts uh, or just above. Uh, let's see with the North Tower, it's standing still and all of a sudden it's in uniform downward motion. There's no jolt, no hesitation as it impacts the cold hard steel below and would slow down uh, and, and it's probably stop and maybe fall off the building, right? Same on the South Tower. It is standing still and all of a sudden it's in uniform downward motion. Well, that is critically important, but we're going to find out why or how that happens also. Uh, NIST says the upper part of the building drove the rest of the building down to the ground and then destroyed itself. That is called the crush down, crush up theory. Uh, it, it, it violates Newton's third law of motion. One, two, it was created, this mathematical wizardry, by Zdenek Bazant of Chicago Northwestern University and submitted just two days after 9-11. The crush down, crush up theory. Uh, he, everybody else is in shock at, at, at our, this attack on our country. This guy, within two days, has created a set of calculations that took engineers 10 years to decode. And when they did, they found it was full of fraud. He doubled the mass up above. He decreased the column strength below by a factor of three. And he um, uh, uh, submitted this without any real review. Go ahead. Oh, nothing. No, keep, keep, keep on. Okay. Well, uh, it, 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 as I mentioned, it violates the laws of physics and he creates all kinds of fraud, which is proven and decoded by Tony Zambodi, Richard Johns, Gregory Zudolinsky, and others. And, and we'll come to that. But the errors are rigged uh, like 24 to one in favor of a collapse. Um, and that we go into that in our detailed webinar, which is on the website, richardgage911.org. But if this were true, the top part destroying the cold, hard, intact steel that's stronger and stronger below, it'd be like a Volkswagen running into a Mack truck. Uh, the Volkswagen is winning in NIST's case. Does it, even if you drop a Volkswagen onto a Mack truck, it doesn't destroy the Mack truck, right? It doesn't matter. The lightest part, the weakest part is at the top. The steel is very light in the top section. It gets heavier and heavier and heavier as you go down. Mm -hmm. Mid height in the building, we're talking 30 inches by 16 inch core columns that are two inches thick and keep on going until at the bottom, it's virtually solid, solid steel down there, 52 inches by 22 inches uh, in diameter, these core columns. So no, the, the top light part is not going to be crushing all that. It's a virtual pyramid, but let's see what the top part is doing. Look, is it crushing the bottom part? No. Something else is happening. Let me make it easier for you. Watch the lower red line. The top part is telescoping in on itself. It's not crushing anything below it in the first couple of seconds here. It is being destroyed itself. The Volkswagen is being destroyed by the Mack truck or by something else. Let's, let's look. Compare it to the volcanic eruption in the Tongan Sea with again, upward, outward, arching streamers, uh, a geometry of fireworks, freely flying solid objects trailed by thick white smoke clouds. It looks more like this volcanic eruption than any kind of a collapse. Were, it a top, were there a top part driving the rest of the building down to the ground, we would see it in the photos, in the videos, not one of them show this after three seconds. Uh, or in the case of the South Tower, four seconds. So were it there, we, it would have crushed these few remaining core columns standing a thousand feet in the air because it was a giant pile driver, right? It would have crushed them. No, the structure was blown out around these, uh, uh, these in interior remaining core columns and they remain uh, through survive that. And then apparently a, a a explosion at the bottom underneath them uh, knocks their 
uh, support out and they fall uniformly. Uh, frame by frame, we see the top part falling through the concrete powder that has been shaken off around it. So what could have done all of that? Let's go to the witnesses, specifically the first responders. Those who were recorded a month after 9-11 by Thomas von Eschen, the fire commissioner, orally recorded such that we have 12,000 pages of testimony read by Professor Graham McQueen, who's now identified not 118, not 156, but 186 witnesses of explosions, many of which are, uh, show us have, have their, their um, experience or visual uh, experience uh, witnessing of these explosions before the towers ever collapse. We felt the ground shake. You could see the tower sway. And then it just came down. There's a specific order of events here. All of a sudden, the ground just started shaking. I felt the train like a train running under my feet. The next thing we know, we look up and the tower is collapsing. It shook my bones shortly before the first tower came down. I remember feeling the ground shaking. I heard a terrible noise and then debris just started flying everywhere. It was, I saw a flash, flash, flash at the lower level of the building. You know, like when they demolish a building with each popping sound, it was initially an orange and then a red flash came out of the building. And then it would just go all around the building on both sides. Saw a number of brief light sources being emitted from inside the building between floors 10 and 15. He saw about six of these brief flashes accompanied by a crackling sound before the tower collapsed. I saw low level flashes. I saw flash, flash, flash. And then it looked like the building came down. You ever see professional demolition where they set these charges on certain floors and then you hear a pop, 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 pop. When I heard that friggin' noise, that's when I saw the building coming down. An explosion appeared at the very top simultaneously from all four sides. Materials shot out horizontally. And then there seemed to be a momentary delay before you could see the beginning of the collapse. How specific does this firefighter, Frank, Frank Crothers, need to be to paint the picture as to what really happened there? There was an explosion in the South Tower. One floor under another. When it hit about the fifth floor, I figured it was a bomb because it looked like a synchronized, deliberate kind of thing. By the way, not one of these witnesses are included in the NIST report, who claims to have interviewed over 116 first responders. Must have missed these ones. It seemed like on television when they blow up these buildings, it seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt, all these explosions. The building was blowing out on all four sides. We actually heard the pops. You know, you heard the pops of the building. I thought the terrorists planted explosives somewhere in the building. That's how loud it was, a crackling explosive. Another loud boom at the upper floors. Then a series of smaller explosions, which appeared to go completely around the building at the upper floors. And another loud earth-shattering blast with a large fireball that blew out more debris. The lower level of the building, you know, like when they demolish a building. That's what I thought I saw. Did you see any flashes? I said, yeah, I thought it was just me. He said, no, I saw them too. Everybody, I think at that point, still thought these things were blown up. So I was fully expecting anything else to blow up. You were there when the planes hit? I said, no, I was there when the building exploded. You mean when it fell down? No, when it exploded. <laughs> He's very clear what he saw. Let's look at feature number three. Is there a straight down progression of destruction? Well, the South Tower starts to lean over, doesn't it? About 22 degrees. It's actually starting to fall off of the building below. So with asymmetrical loading from this top part falling off, asymmetrical damage from the planes, asymmetrical damage from the fires, how in God's heaven do we get complete symmetrical damage all the way around all faces of each building? It makes no sense. 
let's zoom in to the leading corner of this building and ask ourselves, what am I seeing here? I see a series of about a dozen explosions closely spaced with, la with ejections going off below that uh, three or four floors. Is this a progressive collapse? The collapse is, is supposed to, is, is being, uh, we're told is like 20 stories up above. This corner is way ahead of the rest of the destruction. We'll talk about how fast that is traveling down. But, you know, we're looking at explosions here closely spaced. We're not looking at directed energy weapons. We're not looking at mini nukes uh, that are placed uh, throughout the building or, or any other kind of nuke, uh, which are theories that have been put out there. Uh, feature number four, is there isolated explosive ejections? Well, this is very interesting. Look, in fact, 20 stories below the zone of destruction, 40 stories below the zone of destruction, uh, we have no accounting for these in the official narrative. 60 stories below the zone of, in, of destruction. There, there is absolutely no accounting for these in the official narrative. And on the left side of the South Tower, which begins leaning to the right, we can see the cause of the disillusion of this rigid body, which should have fallen off. But if the structure is being destroyed inside of it, it loses its rigidity and doesn't act as one body upon the body below it. It simply disintegrates from inside and settles back down in on itself. How fast is the building coming down? Once again, physics teacher David Chandler analyzes the drop of this building. What does he find? It comes down at near freefall acceleration. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up faster and faster every second. That's the definition of acceleration. Well, what's it, what should have stopped it? The thousands of tons, 80,000 tons of structural steel beneath should have slowed it down and stopped it. It didn't do either. We have more steel on the facade of this building than we have glass. This is an incredibly strong uh, structure that should have absorbed uh, any collapse. Do we have lateral ejection of structural steel elements? Oh yeah, embedding themselves in skyscrapers all around each tower, four ton and eight ton structural steel perimeter wall sections that are even delivered not just 500 feet laterally, but 600 feet, uh, destroying the winter gardens that far away. We can see them laterally ejected. We can see them uh, in this series of stop and goes. This one particularly bothers me. That's World Trade Center 7 that it's about to hit. Let's go back to forward to back to what are we seeing? We're seeing a laterally ejected four ton structural steel section trailed by thick white smoke clouds. What can do that? Steel is not flammable in office fire conditions or by jet fuel, which only burns 600 degrees Fahrenheit according in open air, according to its manufacturer, ME Petroleum. So here we have the ends of these steel on fire. Well, there's no accounting for that in the official narrative. There is accounting for it in the evidence, which we've already seen, i.e. thermite incendiaries. There's enough energy, by the way, to hurl this four ton structural steel section, a 200 pound cannonball, three miles. Well, then we have to ask ourselves if 100,000 tons of steel framing is distributed outside the footprint of the building, What's crushing the building? It's, it's not the steel. The steel is at least three, well, uh, almost half the weight of the building. 
that is uh, not available to crush the building. It's distributed in this, actually a 1400 foot diameter about the building. Uh, and, and the building's only 200 feet wide. A progressive collapse, gravity works how? Down. What do we see going on here? Out. It's well beyond the boundaries the steel is uh, of, of the World Trade Center. Some people say the steel disappeared. No, it got spread out this far. Well, what crushed the building then if it wasn't the steel? Maybe it was the concrete. Because there were, there seemed to be missing floors. There were, what, 110 floors, each an acre in size in each building. What happened to the steel? It's not, we don't see 50 of these floors. We don't see 10. We don't see one on the left side, the World Trade Center. On the right, in a real gravitational collapse in Mexico, we see pancakes, right? That's what we would expect to see in a gravitational collapse. We don't see it. The concrete is missing. Where did it go? Oh, there it is in midair pulverized to a fine powder. All the photos, all the videos show 90,000 tons of concrete in each tower pulverized to a fine powder, 100 micron particles on average, and spread throughout lower Manhattan in a blanket three inches thick from river to river. That's where the concrete is. A total of 180,000 tons of concrete. By the way, if that concrete is pulverized and spread over three square miles, can it crush the building? No, that's another third of the weight of the building. The concrete and the steel together are most all of the weight of the building. It's not, neither of them are available to crush the building. Both of them were used in Zdenek Bazant's analysis to crush the building, but it's not there, not possible. Complete fraudulence on the part of Zdenek Bazant of Chicago Northwestern University. Uh, we've got to get to a real investigation that shows us what happened there. Well, maybe we can look at the evidence, unfortunately, in large, easily the three largest and perplexing structural failures in history. We have the destruction of evidence, 400 truckloads a day, starting just two weeks after 9-11. Where was it sent? To the, the landfill and put on barges then and sent to China for recycling before forensic investigators could get their hands on it and do a proper forensic investigation. Prompting Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering Magazine, to cry out, crucial evidence that could answer many questions is on the slow boat to China, showing an astounding ignorance of government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. But it didn't. And that is one of the key problems for 3,600 architects and engineers who have signed on to the petition demanding a new investigation. Based on the evidence, all 10 key characteristic features and some very uncharacteristic features of controlled demolition in the Twin Towers, fire doesn't create any one of these features, let alone all of them with additional circumstantial corroborative evidence and testimony we have found this to be proof of controlled demolition, a body of proof we've included in our documentary, 9-11 Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out, which includes 40 high-rise architects, structural engineers, metallurgists, chemists, physicists, controlled demolition experts, all laying out this evidence. And the documentary produced by AE 9-11 Truth, uh, where I was the CEO uh, up until a couple of years ago, when we separated and I started uh, richardgage911.org with my wife, Gail, 
And we have for two years been doing 85 podcasts, including Professor Halsey uh, and many, many, many others, experts uh, who are laying out this evidence. All of this can be seen at our website, richardgage911.org. And the one of the top forensic structural engineers in the country, Professor Leroy Halsey is featured in this documentary seven, where he completely uh, analyzed uh, building seven and pulled the rug out from underneath the official NIST report, which says, of course, that fires were responsible for bringing this building down. He says, no way. And so we encourage everybody to support the film process, 9-11 crime scene to courtroom, an unprecedented film series taking hard evidence of 9-11 crimes to court. Because when we get that investigation and that grand jury investigation, the truth about 9-11, the very sad, difficult, painful, uh, evil truth uh, begins to become apparent. So when are we going to take action? I mean, where do we draw our line in the sand? Uh, do, they wait, do we wait for the next false flag operation, uh, which is currently going on in the Middle East? Uh, do we stick our head in the sand? and do nothing, or do we speak the truth about 9-11? I'm suggesting, Lance, that together we can make quite an impact. Here are nine dominoes, each one one and a half times larger than the next. What power do we have individually? Well, watch. If we had 29 dominoes, the tallest one would be the height of the Empire State Building. And that's the, the, the problem we're up against here. This isn't just about buildings, right? Th these three buildings were brought down in controlled demolition. Some group of people, rogue elements within our government and industry, have conspired, obviously, in this conspiracy to manipulate the American people and the people of the world into invading Afghanistan and Iraq, where 2 million were killed, uh, 6,000 6, US soldiers, 30,000 having taken their lives, 22,000, I believe, uh, since. An incredible uh, accumulation of human tragedy we're talking about, all done deceptively in a false flag operation, which we must get to the bottom of and expose completely. And that's what we're about at richardgage911.org. My wife, Gail, and I will not never stop uh, in, until we get a real investigation. Richard, thanks so much for all that uh, beautiful, detailed information. Um, I, so I've got a bunch of questions here that I've just kind of been typing up as we go. And uh, <clears throat> I might have missed this part because there is a lot of information. I just want to make sure that if, if I did, I apologize. Um, but one of the one of the counter arguments that they make, you know, I'm glad you brought up what office what office fires the temperature they typically burn at versus what it takes to actually melt the steel versus also what it takes to evaporate steel. So people can understand those numbers are they're very easy to understand. One of the counter arguments, though, that people try to make is that they say, well, the jet fuel is the reason why it melted the steel beams. And I, I just want to make sure that. What is the counter argument to that? I mean, I'm not sure it was if it was that was missed or if I just missed it. And if I did, I apologize again. Well, some people say that uh, that the jet fuel melted the steel beams. The official narrative actually acknowledges that jet fuel and office fires cannot melt steel beams. They simply suggest that it softened the steel beams. Yet we have ample evidence of molten metal, metal which has been melted steel and iron, which has been melted, requiring over 3,000 degrees. So uh, uh, the, the problem is not the jet fuel, right? The problem is what can create 3,000 and yeah. 4,000 degree temperatures, which we have ample evidence of. And we've shown you that. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't help but notice on the lower right hand of your slides, you, there was the phrase, the amazing parallels between 9-11 and COVID. I will. Oh, can you expand on that? I could, but you will lose your YouTube channel. Oh, that's true. Okay. All right. I, I, I lost I, I, three of them that way. Fair myself. enough. Fair enough. I'll just I, um, suggest that there are plenty of parallels. And on our, on our website, richardgage911.org, there's a whole lot of evidence for those parallels. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, what kind of backlash have you encountered from other architects? Well, um, architects who have seen the evidence, i.e. on at our evidence booth at the AIA conventions, uh, are, are convinced, uh, most all of them, I'd say 95% of them, and they end up signing the petition demanding a new investigation. That's one of the ways we have achieved 3,600 architects and engineers signed on to the petition. Um, we have had uh, feedback from architects who have not seen the evidence. Uh, they just get real angry because they can't conceive that such a thing could be true, that we could have been deceived by our government, by the media on a massive scale, by the American Institute of Architects, unfortunately, of which I'm one of 90,000 members. Um, uh, they, they, they are sorely underinformed and won't take the responsibility because we've invited them on many, many occasions to actually look at the evidence and respond to it. Uh, they just cite uh, incorrectly many times uh, the official narrative uh, and say, well, we've, we've looked at this. Well, no, if you would have looked at this, you would have reported to us who pay you uh, more than $600 a year uh, times 90,000 members yeah. uh, to, to uh, report uh, on your findings. So they don't have, they have not done that. Yeah. The, 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 the funniest thing that I've noticed about it, uh, my fellow architects is that we're supposed to be in theory, some of the most open-minded and creative folks. And I've never actually seen a, a better group of people that are actually the opposite where it's, they're very close minded. The, the political spectrum in which they vote is very much one-sided. And these are all my opinions, not Richard's um, in my pontification here, but it's very strange to me. And it kind of reminds me of Michael Malice in his, in one of his phrases where he says, you know, it's easier to, it's easier to train a smart dog than a dumb dog. And that's the problem, right? High architects, high IQs. We go to school for so much, so long. So, it, so once, once sort of the, the trauma is induced and that everybody experienced in nine 11. And that, I think that's for me, that's where the COVID parallel comes in. It's like, this is all trauma induced. We're then we're much more susceptible to the training from the corporate press, the institutions and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, speaking of that on the, on the institution side of this, I, I I'm just blown away. I was blown away that you actually still have AIA by your name simply because I like if what is their approach to you? I mean, are you sort of this black sheep, this toxic thing that shouldn't be touched? It's amazing to me that they would even, I mean, of course they want your money. They're going to let you put a booth up. They're taking your $600 per year. What's your relationship like with them? Well, um, we found that out uh, when we attempted on three separate occasions to go to the business meeting, the annual business meeting at the annual convention uh, about 10 years ago now. Uh, and uh, attempted to put forth a resolution based on a massive a number of signatures that we had supporting it. And we were able to have five minutes presenting the evidence uh, of which we, only, we had an hour today. We tried to do that in five minutes uh, for Building 7, actually, uh, calling for a resolution in, to, for the AIA to investigate uh, what really happened uh, to this building based on the evidence. And we did achieve 12% of those in attendance at the business meeting, about 300 people, uh, who voted for us. But in five minutes, I can't show the evidence right. needed to convince uh, 300 people. And uh, we tried that three times in, the, in a row. And then uh, finally, we got a letter from the American Institute of Architects suggesting that our missions are not in alignment and that we would not be welcome to come back and have an evidence booth again after that. Oh, that doesn't surprise me whatsoever. It's so funny how they can speak out of both sides of their mouth, health, safety, and welfare. And then it's like, okay, shouldn't we be worried about these, these buildings that collapse in this way that we've never had happen before? If, if, well, if after it, all, yeah, think, think about this. Building seven, as we mentioned several times, is unprecedented. They said it came down by fire. Well, guess what? The firefighting strategy in high rises is to go up into the building, no matter how hot the fire is, because not one has ever collapsed. Right? Mm -hmm. 
they, they affected with cementitious fireproofing. And so if, if one can collapse suddenly, symmetrically, straight down at free fall onto the firefighters who are trying to put out the fire and onto the occupants who are told above the point of the, uh, the floor of the fires to stay in place, this building is designed to keep you safe with a fire below you. We will put it out as firefighters, and then we will evacuate you. That's the current strategy. It hasn't changed in 20 years since we were told that Building 7 could come down by fire. Do you think we have a problem here in inconsistency in policies versus scientific uh, reports put out by NIST about uh, Building 7 and the Twin Towers? So there's a huge inconsistency. And that's why we go to the National Fire Prevention Association for the last three years, two years in a row and upcoming the third year uh, with Raul Angulo, who wrote the book uh, as a Seattle <clears throat> former fire captain <clears throat> on how to fight fires in structures. So he goes and he explains this dilemma to the firefighters, the fire protection engineers. And uh, we have uh, not been kicked out of the NFPA <laughs> conventions yet. Oh, that's good. So we're making progress there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Again, for me, it's for me, it's I don't know how you can claim that one of your sole purposes is health, safety, and welfare, and then we're not willing to at least look at it. But it, you know, it, it sort of digresses back to the smart dog versus dumb dog. What kind of so you mentioned a little bit YouTube. Uh, thanks for saving my channel. But what other kind of social media censorship have you experienced during your efforts? And was there a before and after censorship period for you when you know when Elon Musk took back Twitter? Well, we we are back on Twitter following that. Um, I don't think we got kicked off of Twitter or the other social media platforms, um, uh, but uh, we're we're actively. Uh, putting up our stuff, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, uh, and we're avoiding YouTube now because it's just too much of a problem. It's so painful when you mm -hmm. lose 70, 80 videos, and they don't even tell you what the community violation guideline is. Uh, even when we stop talking about COVID and just talking about 9-11, uh, we, we've lost uh, a channel. So it's just, it's not a fair uh, 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 game that they're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank God for places like Rumble. I know there's, you know, some of the people that are on the fringe sides of the spectrum, the political spectrum that I follow have found a great, safe, comfortable zone in, in Rumble. And that, it's, you know, it's, we're at least have some competition in this sphere now. I think prior to 2020, there wasn't, there wasn't any of that. And, you know, maybe this is sort of the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, what do you think has been the most surprising discovery that you have found? Something that you just didn't even expect um, to come out of you know, all of your work? Well, I, I think it's surprising that the, the mainstream media, with few exceptions, has not uh, seen fit to even cover uh, the incredible uh, documentation that's been putting out, put out, for instance, uh, uh, the University of Alaska <clears throat> has analyzed Building 7 and found that NIST was uh, fraudulent in their in their uh, their own analysis and documentation. This is huge. This should have been uh, in, uh, displayed everywhere. So their ability and willingness to censor is uh, uncanny uh, and, and, and very powerful. Uh, and so we're we we be we we reach the alternative media, mm -hmm. those which are willing to put the truth out there. Jimmy Dory is an example. Roger Stone interviewed me. Uh, the other we David. So we're kind of climbing our way up to the Tucker Carlsons and the Joe Rogans. Uh, if anybody knows those, uh, the, the contact information or those folks. Uh, we need these people to take a, a strong stand, not just dabble in the waters uh, of 9-11, but actually put the evidence out as we've seen it today. Yeah, well, I, I say this half jokingly, but uh, the way to Joe Rogan is actually through me. Uh, there's been a couple of guests we've had on here where I have interviewed them first and then somehow they end up on Joe Rogan in a couple of weeks. So, well, <laughs> I will pray that that happens. I'm a, I'm a religious man, so maybe that'll work. In your favor, I would love to see you in those places, especially Tucker. Huge fan of Tucker over here. Uh, he, he's 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 doing at least half the job that needs to be done, and that's really important. 
Yeah, Joe's yeah. doing about a third of the job that needs to be done. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, hundred percent. And Tucker seems more free now that he's on he's on X, and he yeah. doesn't seem as if he's he's willing to go to the taboo places. Um, hundred mm-hmm. percent. You mentioned the film series you guys are working on. You're in the editing stage. When do you predict that'll come out? Uh, we'll be producing the first episode in March or April, uh, spring, and uh, it followed very closely one after the other, a couple of weeks each after that. And will they, they'll be hosted on your website primarily? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And on YouTube, uh, some YouTube channel, which we hope doesn't get taken down. It, it's all just 9-11. It's all scientific. Mm-hmm. Not, even, not even a lot of the conspiracy theory we've been talking about today, just clearly the scientific evidence. So we hope that new YouTube channel will stay up. There'll be a new website associated w- with it. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be producing it also on... Uh, uh, channels that uh, like Amazon and Hulu and Voodoo and those. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, we'll, we'll watch for them. Uh, no, there are two last questions here, Richard. Again, really appreciate your time being on the show today. I know you're a very busy guy. Um, and I asked this second to the last question to mostly entrepreneurs. So I kind of reframed it for you in a different way. Uh, knowing what you know now, and if you could go back and back in time to when you first started your work surrounding 9-11, what is one piece of advice you give your former self? I haven't thought too much about this. Uh, uh, we started small and we're still small. And uh, we, we started like a hurricane and we tried to reach as many people as we could. The 9-11 truth movement, which I have had the honor to influence uh, has has actually ebbed and flowed over the years. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's flowing now in a really good direction. We're getting a lot of interviews. I mean, I've spoken to groups of one hundred to three thousand uh, about a hundred times all around the world at twenty four countries and eighty two American cities. Uh, we have incredible success rates when we speak. So I would w- work harder on getting more speaking engagements, particularly with technical audiences like this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. And I would um, uh, also uh, reach out I- with a, a greater ferocity to ra- to those uh, mainstream radio stations so we can reach increasingly outside the alternative media and try to get those uh, those courageous and curious radio uh, talk show hosts to uh, to pick this subject up. But we can't do everything. There's just not enough time. I would I would uh, ask for more than 24 hours in a day uh, in my prayers. Yeah, no kidding. I'm with you there. It just never ends, right? Um, Richard, uh, where? Thank you so much again for being on the show. Where can people find, follow, and support your work? One one last plug for all your stuff, please. Yes, the website is richardgage 911org You'll find the documentaries there, the presentations, the podcasts. There's enough evidence there to do some major damage and dent the wall of denial out there. We've got to reach through to the public mind. And so again, we're asking everybody to send this podcast to at least two people. Because if we can do that, those dominoes begin to get heavier and heavier beyond the work that we have started. And pretty soon, the big domino will fall and we'll get through on the mainstream media. At some point, they'll be forced to deal with us. Um, As Geraldo Rivera it did on once on Fox interviewing uh, one of our engineers, one of our family members. <clears throat> he was impressed. He said, gosh, these 1300 architects at the time we had that many mm-hmm. uh, uh, must know something more than I know. Check it out, you guys. So yeah. it was it was it was an impressive uh, spot on mainstream media. We've also I've been interviewed on Washington Journal on C-SPAN, which for 45 minutes gave this evidence. And and guess what? That became the most watched video on their entire website, C-SPAN's website. It's it's really quite uh, 
uh, amazing. And yet uh, they haven't invited us back since uh, I think that was 2014. Yeah. Well, Richard, thanks. Thanks so much for all the work you're doing out there. Uh, God bless you and your wife. And uh, we wish you guys, um, you know, nothing but success. Hopefully do as Richard, do, do as everybody, everybody's listening. As Richard is suggesting, share this episode with two other people, have those two people share with two other people. Um, knowledge is power. Uh, the truth so set, set you set you free. I'm optimistic about the future, Richard. And uh, yeah, thanks again for being on the show. You're so welcome, Lance. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.